Well, thank you, Marilyn, for a very kind and gracious introduction. I have to say it's been a great pleasure over the last uh, seven or eight months getting to know Marilyn. Marilyn is, is really, truly an extraordinary person. She has great capacity as a, as a visionary uh, and as a pragmatic leader uh, in bringing new values and new perspective to, to business and leadership communities. It's also a great, a great pleasure for me to be a member of the table of honor uh, and I have to assure you that that doesn't mean that all the rest of you are at the table of dishonor. Um, and uh, it's, it's wonderful as well to be uh, so welcomed as a guest uh, into this community and so welcomed as a guest into the Royal Roads community uh, as well. Um, the leadership uh, of Maryland particularly in bringing some of these ideas forward uh, is extraordinary and the leadership uh, of, of Alan uh, Cahoon uh, in terms of opening uh, his uh, intellectual community and the leadership uh, of Graydon and others at the Board of Trade in terms of opening their community, the, this community, uh, to new ideas and new visions uh, of, of the future uh, really is genuinely uh, extraordinary. It's very much my pleasure uh, to, to speak with you this morning and I want to take you on a bit of a journey. I want to engage with you and I want to challenge you in a certain way uh, to engage the world literally as it is, so that we can shape it uh, into what it can be. And I want this morning to deliver one very, very simple message, and that's that values, values matter. They matter in science, they matter in politics, they matter uh, in the arts, in humanities, in law, in business, in whatever domain uh, we choose to classify human activity, Values matter and matter a lot. They're absolutely central to how we see the world and, and to how uh, we shape it. And whether it's from bench science uh, to new forms of global governance, uh, values matter not simply in economic terms or, or as catalysts of wealth creation. Uh, our greatest wealth, and I'm going to put this to you now, and I hope that this will really be the center uh, of our uh, discussion over the course of the day, our greatest wealth as human beings, uh, and now uh, as a, uh, a global society of human beings, is the degree to which we can be more humane, more fair, more just uh, in how we structure and function as a global uh, society. We are imperfect as human beings, but in that imperfection, values can be absolutely revolutionary, and they can show us that hope, in fact, is not a fool's choice. In the context of, of global uncertainty and the, the new demands, if you will, uh, that accrue for business leaders, um, there really is a, it's, it's a, a crucial moment for recognizing uh, that business is not separate from society. Business is not simply about extracting wealth. It's not simply about uh, doing so and then giving back. Uh, it's not a separate entity. It's actually integral to, to the viability of society. Uh, and whether that's uh, a national society or a global society, uh, at this point, the, the, the convergence of, of multiple crises, whether it's a fuel crisis, a food crisis, an international financial crisis, climate crisis, population crisis, uh, really uh, demands that business reimagine its place uh, in the kind of constellation or the architecture of our, of our global uh, political economy. And that really means, at least from my perspective, uh, firmly rooting um, itself and its practice in, in, a, in a, uh, a set of values uh, that uh, allow for healthy communities, not just today, but in the future, uh, and that allow for uh, communities to, to adapt, to be resilient, uh, and, and to thrive uh, in a fundamentally different way. And this really requires some deep, careful reflection uh, on the part of business leaders and business communities in terms of how they see themselves, uh, again, not as separate from society, but as part of uh, society.
Well, there are many signs of progress. Uh, and um, I think uh, it's very easy to be overwhelmed uh, and to, um, uh, in a sense, throw one's hands up and, and, and fall back in despair at the complexity of, of the challenges that we face. But I think in the first instance, we need only look to history uh, to see uh, that as human beings, we in fact are capable uh, of extraordinary things, uh, of previously unimaginable um, uh, initiatives that have a huge and significant impact. And so I think, for example, uh, um, very simply, just in the last 200 years, uh, the abolition of the slave trade. Uh, the abolition uh, of um, the slave trade has been a fundamentally redefining um, uh, movement uh, that has, uh, in its essence, it, it began with a reassertion of basic human values and an extension of those values to others uh, and not only an extension, but a demand that those values be extended where certain people and certain forces or actors within society refused. Um, and so that's one very simple concrete example. Another example is the emergence of labor rights, the emergence of, of women's rights, uh, the emergence of children's rights, the emergence of, of uh, the environmental movement, for example, uh, the emergence of uh, the global health movement, is, uh, particularly in the last 20 years or so. Uh, and um, as well the, the, the creation of the United Nations uh, in, in the face of, of the two great wars of the last century um, and um, uh, 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 as well the creation today of the International Criminal Court, however imperfect, and all of these things themselves are, are, are imperfect, uh, but uh, they're very much a movement in the right direction according to the right kind of uh, value-based compass that that uh, that uh, we need to uh, we need to uh, uh, to move towards, and I think more recently uh, of um, very concrete examples uh, around, for example, the convention to to ban the use of landmines uh, in warfare. I think of uh, the international uh, treaty on tobacco and tobacco control. Um, I think of um, the uh, uh, the fact that that. Uh, new forms of governance uh, are emerging internationally, both formally and informally. And I think uh, as well uh, of um, new coalitions that are now forming nationally and internationally within the business community, within civil society, uh, among governments, um, and that there is very much a, uh, uh, an ethos of, of pragmatism uh, and at the same time a willingness uh, to uh, uh, um, reimagine the value base uh, that we uh, that we hold as human beings. Uh, so, uh, on the one hand, you know it's very easy to be uh, uh, despairing, but I think one has to look at the world with a with a high degree of humility, uh, uh, see the world in a broader perspective, both historically and in terms of the future, and then um, make your choice about who you are going to be. Uh, both as an individual uh, and who you are going to be as a business, who you're going to be as a government, who you're going to be as a civil society organization, and so on. Uh, and from that perspective of humility, uh, broad uh, historic and future-oriented perspective, um, insight is possible wherein you can make that kind of clear value choice about how you are going to be in the world so that you can make a serious, significant, uh, and, and, and transformative change in the world. Thank you. Yeah, I think Canada uh, uh, as a nation um, seriously undervalues um, its responsibility uh, to engage the world in a meaningful way. Uh, historically and comparatively speaking, uh, we have one of the most successful societies in human history. Uh, we have a society that is uh, based and practiced uh, in the concept of cosmopolitanism, uh, in the concept of uh, uh, inclusiveness in the concept of respect in the context uh, in, 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 in the concept of, of uh, uh, engaged um, pragmatic 
uh, uh, nation building and community building. Um, we have enormous experience uh, that is profoundly important today uh, internationally. Uh, and I think it is vital uh, um, for the world and for us as part of the world uh, that we play a much more uh, significant uh, role uh, internationally, that we re-engage uh, in multilateralism, for example. Um, in the last few years, we have stepped back. Uh, we need to re-engage and do so not simply from the perspective of the pursuit of self-interest, but uh, uh, from the pers uh, perspective of the pursuit of common interest. Because only in recognizing um, the, 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 the import, the importance of, of common interest, is it possible for an individual, uh, whether it's a person or a nation, to actually thrive? We're at a point now, I believe, in human history where we are, we are, there is a complex interdependency uh, uh, that has never before existed to the degree that it exists today. Um, you know, we're a, we're a planet of seven billion people today. Uh, we're a planet where uh, issues like emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, uh, H, H1N1, SARS, for example, tuberculosis, HIV, uh, uh, these are, are global uh, challenges, uh, and they're global challenges uh, of, the co of, of the common good. And the only way one can uh, in, uh, engage meaningfully, for example, to address those issues is by, by taking a common good perspective. That's true for emerging infectious diseases, it's true for the international financial crisis. Uh, it's true for climate change. Uh, it's true for the uh, energy crisis. It's true for the food security crisis uh, that exists internationally. Uh, and it's true for any one of a number of other major, major uh, 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 policy domains. Uh, and Canada has, uh, again, enormous experience uh, with, um, uh, with creating uh, uh, a society uh, that can deal meaningfully and respectfully uh, and uh, inclusively uh, and pragmatically uh, with issues that, that are fundamental to, to the very being of a society and to the growth and prosperity of a society. Uh, we've achieved great things in this country. Uh, we have problems, we certainly do. Um, but how we approach those problems uh, uh, is critical. Uh, to the success uh, of this nation. And how we approach the kind of problems that I've talked about internationally is critical to the, the, the success of our global uh, community. I think when we think of leadership, um, often we think of uh, a person who uh, has a kind of a galvanizing vision. Um, this is true uh, to a certain extent, but there are other elements of leadership that are, that are vital. There's no such thing as a leader without followers. And people do not follow what they do not believe. How do you come to a place where you create within your community the, the possibility of leadership? where you create the, 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 the enabling environment where different people can lead at different times in different ways. I think that one of the values that, 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 that I've learned um, is very important to that process uh, is, is humility, in fact. And it, 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 it means humility from an individual perspective, but also from a community perspective in relationship to other communities. And it means, humility really means, it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a perspective that allows you uh, to see what you previously couldn't see because you're so clouded with your own self-interest or your own goals or, or whatever. It allows you to see, again, the broad sweep of history. It allows you to see the future uh, or that a future exists with or without you. Right? It, and, and it allows you uh, insight. It allows you to understand, to literally stand under uh, what it is that you know and to see it in a different way. And so from that perspective, with humility, you gain insight, you gain the possibility of a different vision, 
And you also gain a certain, um, uh, the, a certain willingness, if you will, uh, to, to listen to others, to engage others, and to hear what they're saying. And this, I think, is, is fundamental to leadership. Because people, again, there's no such thing as a leader, at least in a democratic sense. There are certainly uh, uh, are leaders who, are, who don't have followers. But in, in uh, a democratic uh, conception, and particularly in a cosmopolitan democratic conception, leadership requires followers. And people will follow when they're heard, when they believe uh, in what a person is, is offering or saying, when that offering comes from a process of dialogue, comes from a process of reflection, and in fact is a, a certain kind of uh, f uh, manifestation or form making of a community perspective. So in order to do that, uh, in order to be part of that process, perspective matters enormously. And a, a, a perspective of humility uh, allows uh, for you to see and allows for you to formulate and allows for you not only to enable your own self or your own uh, uh, ability to lead, but also to recognize when others are better uh, at that particular moment, at that particular time for that particular issue. And you will enable them to lead. And you will enable them to, to, to uh, uh, to be the voice, if you will, or the vision or the expression of a particular community perspective.